Okay, hello everyone. Uh, in this series of lectures, in fact, I am planning a series of three lectures here. We will be talking about uh, bituminous emulsions, and in fact, in the last editions of the mechanical characterization of bituminous material, we somehow did not uh, cover this portion. And uh, as we started working on emulsions for uh, recycling, for cold mixes, and for cement asphalt mortars, we realized that the highway engineer should actually learn little bit or maybe lot more about uh, uh, bituminous emulsion. Okay. So, uh, this is the action plan I have got for uh, this particular series of lectures. We will just give you a brief background about overview of the emulsion. We will have the ASTM classification for emulsion. We will also talk about how the emulsion is manufactured and uh, the actual use of emulsion is when it breaks down. So, this is the interesting uh, thing here and I will be emphasizing this again and again at uh, many places. First, how to make the emulsion, then how to break it down. Then what are the different kind of emulsifiers that are being used, something about the emulsion setting, emulsion test procedures and so on and so forth. As of now, this is the content that I have. We will, if needed, we will also talk about a uh, uh, little bit about the cold mixes and their associated technologies, right. Uh, the basic references that I would uh, uh, suggest for the entire class here is this one. Uh, this is a very precise and concise circular that is available for you to download. All you really need to do is to type uh, asphalt emulsion technology in any of your search engines, you will be able to get this PDF, PDF file. You can also uh, take asphalt emulsion technology review of the asphalt emulsion residue procedures, this is also downloadable. This is a very clean and nice uh, journal paper, in fact, this is a uh, journal paper. And if any of you are interested in proceeding further in research related things, this is a paper that you may want to write. There are many more papers. So, my suggestion is if you get in touch with me at jmk dot at iatm.ac.in, I will be very happy to forward some of this uh, journal papers to you. So, okay. so, let us start talking about this uh, uh, emulsion. Some statistics I need to give before we start. The first asphalt or bitumen emulsion, um, people started using it in the early part of the 20th century. And as of now, this is a roughly a two year old statistics, more than 8 million emulsions are being produced. This could be for prime, for tack, for cold mix applications for maintenance, for slurries, etcetera. And approximately 10 percent of the paving grade bitumen that is pro produced is used in the emulsified form because obviously for making an emulsion you need uh, bitumen and uh, if you look into the total percentage of bitumen more than 10 percent is being used for uh, emulsification. So, why exactly is this asphalt emulsion? Why do we really need this asphalt emulsion? The first point, mm -hmm. uh, if you must have seen in our discussions on mixing and compaction temperatures, you really need to heat the bitumen at to a high temperature, so that it can actually coat the aggregate particles. A very smart way of doing it will be is to somehow make the bitumen or the asphalt binder flow at room temperature. If you could make them flow at room temperature and uh, then it will be much easier to coat the bitumen uh, without any subsequent heating. Right. So, if you are really interested in low temperature usage, because normally what will really happen at 60 degree centigrade, your viscosity is of the order of anywhere between 100 to 4000 poys. Whereas, for emulsion it will be only in the range of 0.5 to 10 poise. So, it is it is clearly a game changer number one. Number two, you 
have phenomenal reduction in the emulsion uh, emission there is a reduction in the energy consumption and you are also avoiding the oxidation of the binder because when you are heating it superheating it you have already discussed uh, about short term aging simulated through rolling thin film oven long term aging simulated through pressure aging vessel so this kind of aging is uh, not going to happen for this material and less hazardous obviously because you know you are working with a material at room temperature though this is not really a going to be a issue you can immediately ask so i can always uh, take bitumen add some solvent to it cut it cutting it back and in fact in the interest industry what they will say is let's cut it so this cut back asphalt but the cut back asphalt is not environmentally friendly because you are going to use a solvent and most of the solvents that are used for making this uh, bitumen to flow at a room temperature at a much less viscosity are not really very user friendly okay they are not environmentally friendly then the constitution construction of a roadway with the cold technique uh, consumes approximately half the energy these are the calculations are available and then in addition to it there are many things you could do okay for instance you can uh, make an uh, uh, use the emulsion mix it with the cement or with uh, latex natural rubber and you can actually uh, come out with uh, different properties so right now at iit madras we are working on what is called as the cement asphalt mortar so we take emulsion we add cement mortar to it aluminum powder defoamer admixtures air entraining agents many things and then we make a product that is used in this high speed rail that is that our country is planning so you will not there will not be any ballast here but this mortar will be used uh, in the place of the ballast below the uh, rail and above the deck slab so it kind of uh, works as a shock absorber okay so there are many many uses related to it okay so what exactly is an asphalt emulsion so if i um, write the definition you may want to uh, write it is an emulsion is a dispersion of small droplets of one fluid okay in another fluid so the examples could be milk is an emulsion butter is an emulsion cosmetic creams are emulsions so you take one fluid disperse it in another fluid actually the uh, wordings are seems to be straight forward and simple but uh, it the complexity is in making uh, one fluid disperse in the other fluid and in most of the fluids one of the phase is always water okay and based on this we can have different types of classifications so the first classification that you see is shown in this picture what is really called as oil in water so that means the continuous phase is water and the dispersed phase is an oily liquid okay so this is water and this is your oil okay and another uh, thing that you can think of it is water in oil oil in water okay so here the continuous phase is uh, oil and the dispersed phase is water so this is your next emulsion that you see here which is uh, water in oil and uh, you can have multiple emulsions so the dispersed phase can contain another phase which may not have the same composition as the continuous phase so if you uh, look at this very carefully so you have water you have oil and inside this you also have water so that is why you call this as water in oil in water so 
multiple emulsions are basically possible ok right. So, uh, the idea here is standard asphalt emulsions that you see are typically of the oil in water type. So, which means roughly around 40 to uh, 45 75 percent of uh, bitumen is there. Uh, then uh, you are going to have emulsifier which is of the order of up to 2.5 percent and the rest is going to be water. And the bitumen droplet range is going to be somewhere between 0.1 to 20 microns. So, if you are going to have around 20 microns you are going to call them as macro emulsion and some bitumen uh, uh, droplets will also contain some amount of uh, smaller water droplets within them in which case you are going to call them as water in oil in water and multiple uh, emulsions ok. And the uh, viscosity of the emulsion basically will now depend on the internal water phase. So, you have water you have bitumen and you are going to disperse bitumen in water and the proportions are something that are given here ok. So, this is the uh, basic background here right. Uh, now, comes the most important thing the next thing that you will ask is. So, what should be the particle size distribution will that particle size distribution uh, play a critical role yes. So, the particle size distribution. So, this is the distribution of the particle size in emulsion that you see here in this picture the x axis it is not slightly uh, clear it is in microns. You can actually see roughly around 6 to 8 microns and this is the percentage distribution that you see here. So, if you actually take a snapshot of it and see you can actually see your water your oil and everything. Now, this basically depends on what is really called as the emulsion recipe as well as the mixing condition and the particle size and the particle size distribution strongly influence the physical properties of the emulsion, how the emulsion flows, how the emulsion breaks, how it functions and everything. And now, what will really happen this is very interesting if you are going to have large particle size this basically will bring down the viscosity of the emulsion and similarly, if you are going to have a bimodal distribution. So, what do I mean by bimodal distribution if you are going to have something like this two distributions put together. So, that is also kind of going to bring down the viscosity ok. So, uh, the point is if you are going to have smaller particle size you are going to have wonderful performance as far as the mix and spray applications are concerned ok because the surface area is now going to be high ok. So, you let us say you take 1 liter of uh, bitumen and then you shear them make it into droplets if you are going to have bigger size droplets the surface area is less, but if you are going to have smaller size particles the surface area is more. And the challenge that now you see is how do you really control the properties of the emulsion through the particle size and distribution. So, this is the key factor and in fact, in any emulsion manufacturing unit that uh, you go and see they will have what is really called as a particle size. analyzer. So, they will be in a position to get a graph something like this and depending on the application that they want you could have some graph like this or you could have some other graph like this ok. So, that that is more or less is the idea behind all these things. Now, the important thing that we really want to ask here is how do we really control the uh, rheological properties and uh, now you know when we use the word rheological properties what we really mean by that F for a moment the rheological properties means many things to many of us here, but we will be talking in terms of viscosity the shear thinning nature. I hope you recollect the discussion that we had 
in the earlier classes when we talked about what is shear thinning, what is shear thickening, etc. Okay, you can identify from this picture what is a shear thinning. So, if I really want my emulsion to shear thin, what should I do? Should I worry about the particle size? Should I worry about the particle distribution, amount of emulsifier that we add and the proportion of asphalt water emulsion. So, this is emulsifier. These are basically the uh, manner in which we can actually control what exactly is going to be the rheological properties of emulsion. Right. So, we had a very brief introduction about uh, asphalt emulsion, its definition oil in water, water in oil, oil in water in oil, different uh, types and what is the particle size distribution. Now, let us go to the emulsion classification. Okay. So, I am just going to walk you through each one of this and these are definitions that we know from our school. So, when we use the word cationic, basically what we mean is it carries a net positive charge. You can have anionic emulsions in which the droplets carry a negative charge. Okay. Now, you must be immediately wondering where is this coming from? In fact, if you just uh, uh, think about it, so let us say you have a small volume like this and you have one asphalt droplet, other asphalt droplets and these are the medium in which this is dispersed. What is stopping these uh, two droplets of asphalt because they all from the same family, right? What is that stopping them from? Uh, joining together, what you do is during the emulsification operation, you kind of uh, ensure that the charges are in such a way that they repel each other. Okay. So, if the net charge outside one droplet is positive, then they are just going to keep bouncing each other, they are not going to come together. So, that is the thing. So, if you are going to have a cationic emulsion, it is going to carry a positive charge. If you are going to have an anionic emulsion, it is going to have a negative thing. Then, this is in terms of the charge. Then, we can define this in terms of how fast they set, how fast they break, breaking. Okay. So, if you are going to have a rapid setting emulsion, then uh, they will set quickly in contact with clean aggregate, quickly it will break. So, if you are going to have aggregates which are having a low surface area, typically that are used in uh, chip seals, they uh, set rapidly. You can have, I will come to the name this one, slow setting and it will be with the reactive aggregates having high surface area. Okay. So, that is the uh, second classification. Then you can have medium setting emulsion which is uh, sets sufficiently less quickly and having a low surface area and finally, we can now put them together. So, RS emulsion is used with reactive and unreactive. Uh, uh, it is very reactive and use it always with unreactive aggregates. SS is unreactive, but you use it with reactive aggregates. So, that is the catch that you see here. Okay. So, now you can actually start combining these things. So, you had a cationic emulsion, you had an anionic emulsion, you have a rapid setting, slow setting, medium setting. So, what ASTM uh, gives this is, so if I say CRS, you are talking about cationic rapid setting emulsion cationic medium setting emulsion, cationic slow setting emulsion and uh, similarly for anionic emulsions and again there are different designations that are given here. So, you can have rapid setting, medium setting, slow setting, it could be followed by numbers 1, 2. So, if it is going to be 1 and uh, if it is going to be 2, it is of different reactivity, you can also have a letter H. So, whether it is a hard asphalt. So, you can have SS1H which basically says slow setting 
low reactive anionic emulsion with low viscosity and a hard asphalt residue. If you are going to write CRS2, you are talking in terms of reactive cationic emulsion of very high viscosity that is what you are talking about. So, one is number one is for low reaction, number two is for high reactivity. So, if you write it as CRS2, you talk about reactive cationic emulsion having very high viscosity. You can have quick setting, you can have again cationic quick setting uh, somewhere in between MS and SS and you can also add various uh, uh, letters such as it could be polymer, it could be latex modified uh, emulsion. So, so these na letters are added to each of these things to say whether it is a polymer or whether it is a latex modified uh, emulsion. You can have an prime AEP, you can have penetration emulsion prime, you can have recycling agent emulsion. So, these are some of the acronyms that are used in the industry, but normally for you it is enough if you know understand what is CRS, what is CSS and then what is uh, uh, SS1 and all those things. So, that should be good enough, do not worry too much about that. Now, when it comes to the testing, the testing has to be done in terms of different categories. See, for instance, if you are an user, you want to buy this emulsion, okay. And uh, when you buy this emulsion, uh, there are some tests that you do. But let us say you are the manufacturer, okay, you will be doing some test for that. So, depending on it, the testing procedures completely vary. So, <clears throat> if you are talking in terms of uh, handling properties of the emulsion, how much is the residue content? Let us say you are buying an emulsion and you expect the bitumen residue to be of the order of let us say 65, 65, 35. So, we need to find out how much of bitumen is there because what will really happen ultimately after the emulsion is used in the field the water is gone and what you really have is the residue, the, the emulsion, the bitumen residue. So, you would like to have, uh, have an idea about how much of residue is there. So, this is about the residue content. How to handle them? What is the viscosity? And what about the storage stability? Storage stability, this is really a big issue because these systems are inherently unstable ok. So, that is why I when I uh, teach these things in the class or when I take my students out to this emulsion uh, production factories, I always tell them this is making this emulsion is more art than science or engineering. So, some knack is there in making them very carefully, but we will get into the technology part as we go along. Then the next class if you test that you want to do is you want to find out the classification of emulsion. So, if you buy a CSS cationic emulsion, how do you know that it is cationic? You need to test find out what is the net charge there, then how much uh, demulsifiability, how it, it will break, what is the cement mix test, what about the coating test. And then obviously, you are going to use bitumen to make this emulsion, you would also like to know from the residue that you have recovered what is the grade of bitumen. So, it could as of now in the olden days they just used to do the penetration, but these days we are also doing the PG testing for the emulsion residue ok. And then something what is really called as the performance test, this has not been explored ok. So, let us now try to get into the emulsion manufacturing part. So, this is a, a quick fix picture on how uh, the emulsion is made. There are uh, different variants of it, but what I have shown here is what something uh, it is a general schematic. So, what you have is the following. So, there are two things here, uh, the asphalt which is kept at a high temperature, then the soap solution.
So, this is called as the soap solution. So, here you take the emulsifier, you add acid or base depending on whether what is the pH that you really want. You have a stabilizer and then you add it with water. So, this is the uh, complete chemical that you buy from there. This is mixed with water. So, this is the soap solution. Then you take this asphalt, let us say I am roughly giving this temperature 120, it can be even higher than that 130 or 140 degree centigrade, run it through the colloidal mill. Okay. So, you uh, literally shear it into small droplets of 10, 20 microns, 8 micron, 10 micron and at the same time introduce this soap solution there. So, what happens? Each and every droplet gets coated with this soap solution and it, since now there is a charge imbalance is there, they repel each other and they kind of float in the water and that is how you get your emulsion. So, bring asphalt from here, bring the emulsifier from here, run it in the colloidal mill and you get your emulsion. So, let me just read out some of the few key words that you should keep in mind. Hot bitumen. So, you should talk in terms of the temperature with water containing emulsifying agents and applying mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is the energy that you impart on it using your colloidal mill to break up the bitumen into droplets. The manufacturing process not only affect the physical properties of the emulsion, but it will also affect the performance of the emulsion. What is the particle size distribution? How much, how stable these emulsions are? Okay. It is uh, very important to understand here, again some keywords will be underlined here. Yeah, the emulsification will be opposed by internal cohesion, because you know you are breaking them into these droplets and uh, viscosity of the bitumen and the surface tension of the droplet which will basically resist the creation of this uh, new surface. Now, if you really want smaller droplets, you have to provide considerable amount of high energy okay? and uh, you also need to have low bitumen viscosity at the emulsification temperature. It is a tricky issue, we will discuss this as we go along. Okay, so, please think about it, 120 degree centigrade you bring, bring 120 or 130 degree centigrade you bring the bitumen, make them into droplets and you are adding the soap solution which is at a room temperature. Okay. So, there is going to be a complex set of interactions that are going to take place there. And since emulsion consists of water, let us say 35 percent water, obviously the emulsion exit temperature has to be much lower, 60 degrees centigrade or 50 degrees centigrade or something. So, from 120 degrees centigrade room temperature 30 degrees centigrade and mixing them together and the exit temperature is going to be of some particular order. There are something like uh, emulsion exit temperature uh, that we will discuss as we go along, right. But just keep that in mind that if you are going to have smaller droplets, you need to have a very high powerful colloidal mill, you need to have low viscosity. Now, the low viscosity will be got by you by heating the uh, temperature, increasing the temperature of the bitumen or maybe some manufacturer also try to dilute the bitumen a little bit. <coughs> and what about the concentration of the emulsifier that basically you add? Now, because if it is becomes smaller droplets, the surface area becomes more and if the surface area becomes more, the amount of emulsifier that you need to add also increases. So, understand and the emulsifier basically we dissolve it in the water phase and the soap solution is mixed with the hot bitumen in the colloidal mill. There are <coughs> uh, many complex uh, interrelationships between uh, manufacturing variables and emulsion properties. In fact, this picture is from the shell bitumen handbook. 
okay you can see think of it this way <coughs> particle size distribution you can see what are all the factors here manufacturing temperature emulsifier and the mill gap the breaking rate how fast they break these factors are given here viscosity is uh, given here storage stability is also given here so you are talking about bitumen type bitumen content salt dope acid dope thixotropic agent aqueous phase composition flow rate through the mill addition of electrolyte breaking agents whether you are using polymer spraying temperature manufacturing temperature do you add kerosene calcium chloride addition emulsifier in bitumen as well as the uh, colloidal mill uh, details okay so this is as far as the emulsion manufacture is concerned now when it comes to the emulsion breakdown so now we understood how to make an emulsion in a very simplified form okay this is only an introductory lecture about uh, emulsion in a very simplified form we understood that now how do we really uh, 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 what really happens so two things happens here so there is this is in fact what is really called as the dlvo theory there is a repulsion which is electrostatic repulsion there is a van der waals attraction okay so let us say this is uh, droplet b droplet a they are going to bouncing each other because of this electrostatic repulsion both are cationic okay net positive charge but there is also a van der waals attraction that is going to happen the moment these two things balance each other so you can actually uh, write it in this particular way you go in this way and you go here then in this region you are going to have the emulsion breaking down is going to take place this is the interparticle distance you may want to focus your attention on the distance here it is given in terms of nanometer okay so there are many theories that are available for the breakdown of the asphalt emulsion what here i am going to talk about is the possibility of an emulsion breaking down without getting in touch with the mineral aggregate okay so this is the theory here that i am going to talk about later we will talk about how the emulsion will actually break down in the presence of mineral aggregate okay right so you have your uh, uh, bitumen droplet this yellow color that you see is the surfactant surrounding it the emulsion charge that you see on the droplet will prevent the close approach number 1 number 2 is now let us assume that you know you are just trying to push them mechanically or they are coming together van der waals attraction is more there are two the first thing that you see is they start forming a flock flock formation so close approach of the droplets leads to adhesion between the droplets and slowly the water is squeezed out then you come to the next stage is what is really called as coalescence now what will really happen the water drains between the droplets and the surfactant film will break down and the droplets fuse trapping some amount of water so this is the uh, uh, technology here okay coalescence and then what happens the trapped water diffuses out and then you get a complete droplet a full sphere of bitumen so what you really had as 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 okay so that you are going to have one single blob of bitumen so this is without the presence of the mineral aggregate so this is the basic idea behind this emulsion breaking down now the interesting part is uh, i mean it is not really very clear but let me just make the thing between uh, before coalescence this process is reversible i'm sorry so let me just write it with blue 
reversal. But here this becomes irreversible. Okay. So I have actually written down some of these things for your benefit because in case if you are not able to download these things, you can read it from these slides. So during mixing, so flocculation, fusion of droplets is quiescence. Okay. Uh, the source of the charge, why is this charge happening is the emulsifier here as well as ionizable components in the asphalt itself. So, this is the electrostatic barrier that we really talked about and when they achieve enough M energy to overcome this barrier, they adhere, the flocculation is reversible. Okay, so, that means how do you really do that? You could agitate and in fact, you can see, you must have seen this in some emulsion factories wherein they will just roll the drum. If they feel that there is some kind of a settlement that is happening, they will roll the drum and then the emulsion will become the uh, flocks that you see there will not happen. But on the other hand, we can, some people will also uh, add little more emulsifier, not water, emulsifier. Okay. Then we talked about coalescence and I mentioned here that uh, this is irreversible. And I have a question here, lower viscosity asphalt coalesce more rapidly than high viscosity asphalt. Why? So, find out the answer and uh, put it in the uh, email list. Okay. Right. So, then we start talking about little bit about the emulsifier. So, what exactly are this emulsifier? The water molecules at the interface between oil and water have higher energy than those in the bulk water. Now, this is something that you need to really understand very carefully. I have seen in my experience as talking to practicing engineers that sometimes they di try to dilute the emulsion by adding water. Now, we need to understand one thing, the bulk water that you add is not the same as the water that is available in the emulsion. Okay, so, if you try to add them together, they are really not going to mix in the way in which you expect. Okay, so, one needs to be very, very careful about it, number one. Now, so, please remember this, this is the most key thing, important thing, higher energy, right. There is a tension and this tension basically tries to minimize the interfacial area and uh, this is a very interesting operation. You are trying to create an interfacial area considerably large, approximately 500 square meters per liter. So, if I give you 1 liter of emulsion and then if you make them, uh, so 1 liter of bitumen and if you make an emulsion out of it and try and compute what is the uh, surface area, you probably have made 500 square meters of area. So, this is the most important thing and we keep using this word surfactant, this is nothing but surface active agents. That is what is really called as a surfactant. Now, this is the uh, simplest picture that you can think of it this way. So, there are three things here. One is there is an oil loving. So, this is basically the structure or what you can say a key map of what this emulsifier is. There is an oil loving group, uh, hydrocarbon chain. There is a water loving one. So, this is the head group, this is the tail group. So, this is in water, this is in oil. There is an interesting person here who is a counter ion, it is water loving. So, the surfactants basically have lipophilic that is oil loving, polar hydrophilic that is water loving portions in the same molecule and in addition to that we have a counter ion. So, this is the structure of an emulsifier. So, how does it look like? So, this is oil, this is water, a zoomed version of 
the interface between a bitumen droplet and water. So, what you see here is the tail group, this is your head group and these are this counter ions. The surfactant molecule will concentrate at the interface between the water and bitumen oriented with the polar group in the water and non-polar part in the molecule in the oil. And now what will really happen, how do we really get this net positive charge is the counter ion will basically diffuse into the water phase and it will leave you a, with a net positive charge. That is how these things are done. Okay. So, if you basically take a look at it, uh, some of the uh, commercial names that are seen here, it could be a tal oil, it could be alkyl benzene, it could be tallo valquil. Okay. So, the head group will have this portion, the counter ion is going to be like this, the head group charge is given here and this is depending on whether you are looking at a pH 2 or a pH 11. For instance, if you see here, so uh, if I use C L, okay, basically trying to use it with uh, uh, having an acid and so that having a uh, pH around 2, these are all some of the things that you are going to hear. A typical emulsifier, this is something that is very important, will have an hydrophilic head group, lipophilic tail group and there will be around 12 to 18 carbon atoms. You can have anionic, cationic and of course, you can have also non-ionic type emulsifier depending on the charge their head groups adopt in the water. So, I will not get into the details about this non-ionic, I will leave it for a moment because we have to introduce some things like zeta potential and many other things to define this, the chemistry becomes a little bit complex. So, I will leave that. So, emulsifiers are normally supplied in water insoluble form to the emulsion producer packets. Now, what you do the first thing is you neutralize it either with acid or alkali and to generate basically a cationic or a anionic or a cationic water soluble form for preparing the soap solution. So, if you use hydrochloric acid or phosphoric acid, uh, you this is the typically the acid that is used and if you use sodium or potassium hydroxide, you use alkalis. So, if you are interested in a cationic emulsion, you are going to use an acid. If you are interested in an anionic emulsion, you are going to use something like an alkali. So, you can actually see the first equation, you can see the second equation. So, this is going to be the difference between the cationic and the anionic emulsion. Okay. Now, the interesting point is if you uh, recipe, what are the basic ideas here is if you increase the concentration of the emulsion, it will decrease the reactivity. Okay. And uh, let us uh, for instance, we will understand we have a very highly reactive aggregate and we typically want something like an MS emulsion. So, what do you really want to do? You want to increase the emulsion concentration. Typical emulsion recipes will look something like this. So, this is cationic rapid setting, cationic slow setting, anionic rapid setting, anionic slope setting. So, now let us go through uh, one here and one there. So, the proportion of asphalt is going to be roughly let us say 65. Okay. And here also we will take a look at it because this is also 65. Now, this is the uh, emulsifier that you are going to use percentage is something like 0 0.2 and percentage is something like 0 0.3. Then you are using a hydrochloric acid, so which gives you your cationic thing is 0.15, this is of the order of 0 0.12. The soap pH is going to be somewhere between 1.2 to 2.5 and here it is going to be obviously 11 to 12 because the you are using a NaOH the remaining is water. Okay. So, this is the classification system between 
cationic uh, rapid setting and anionic rapid setting. So, let us look at cationic rapid setting vis a vis the <coughs> cationic slow setting. What is the difference here? The difference is the bitumen content that you use is slightly less and the emulsifier dosage that you see here is more. Okay. The soap pH could be of any order and this is what is added here. Similarly, you can actually see here if it is going to be slow setting between 0.3 this is going to be something like 0.5 and you use lignins and the pH is more or less of the same variety. So, we will also have, we need to understand that there is going to be some amount of salt and which will lead into some kind of a osmotic uh, swelling that will happen and uh, you typically add either calcium or sodium chloride to reduce the osmosis of uh, water into the bitumen. Okay. There are some additional things that are added what are called adhesion promoters, then some solvents are added because we normally what we want to do is to get the binder viscosity correct. So, we do not want to increase the temperature too much. So, some solvents are added. You might also talk about polymer modified emulsion, we will not talk about it as far as this course is concerned. Okay. Right.